Yeah, this is less blurry. You see, I moved. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm just going to give us one more minute to allow more students to log in, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, great. Hello again. My name is Jessica Stern and I'm part of the Viterbi Admission and Student Engagement Team at the USC Viterbi School of Engineering. And first and foremost, we want to congratulate you collectively on your admission to USC, to the School of Engineering, and specifically to the Masters of Science program in Systems Architecting and Engineering. Uh, we know you worked very, very hard for this, so congratulations on your achievement. It is definitely it should be celebrated. So thank you for considering USC and we very much hope to welcome you this fall. Um, hopefully you've already become very well acquainted with the university. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to visit campus, but if not, I'd like to give you just a brief overview, some highlights about the university and the School of Engineering and some resources to help you navigate this time as you figure out um, your options for fall and, and start preparing for your studies with us. So USC 
world leading private research university in downtown Los Angeles. And the School of Engineering in particular um, has been consistently ranked among the top graduate engineering programs in the United States. Um, you can see we have more than 6,000 students pursuing their master's and PhD degrees at the USC Viterbi School of Engineering. So we do skew more graduate than undergraduate. Um, I would say about a thousand of those are pursuing their PhDs and the rest are taking um, their master's degree programs, either in person or online through our Dennett Viterbi platform. Um, speaking of Dennett Viterbi, which many of you may be Den students, um, I want to mention that it has been con consistently ranked as the top five online master's engineering program um, for the last 10 years plus. Um, so definitely you are in good hands with us, whether you take our program in person or online. Um, we do have also an incredibly strong alumni network um, at USC as a whole. You may have already heard about the Trojan family or the Trojan network. Uh, that's definitely rings true for the School of Engineering where we have more than 88,000 um, of our graduates worldwide, um, very connected. This is a very good opportunity for you to not only build a sense of community wherever you may come from or live, um, but also in terms of career opportunities and growing within your career. We are also a research university, as I mentioned, more than $213 million in annual research expenditures. Um, and we have 38 research centers that many of our master's students engage in as well um, at the School of Engineering. Los Angeles, for those of you who will be taking the program in person and moving to LA or you may already know a little bit about the city, but just to, to position you, um, the University of Southern California is in downtown Los Angeles. And you can see in this map, uh, that blue blob is the coast, it's the ocean. And that whole area where you see all these different tech companies is affectionately known as Silicon Beach. This is sort of an ecosystem of, of 500 plus startups, plus many branch offices um, in tech and other industries that are headquartered in Silicon Valley. You'll also see ISI and ICT. These are research centers that belong to USC. So we have very, very close ties to this area and well beyond. Um, this has implications not only, again, for, for career opportunities, network opportunities, um, but even so much in the classroom, which you'll get to hear about a bit later. Um, LA obviously has so much more to offer. We are a global hub for innovation, for business, for the arts. There is no shortage of things to do here. So you will most definitely have a very dynamic experience as a student, both inside and outside the classroom. Our community is very diverse. We have students um, from virtually every state within the US. Um, as well as more than 100 countries around the world at USC. And this is uh, true for the School of Engineering as well. We have a very um, wide community spanning all over the world and um, very varied interests. And you'll have a chance to interact with students with many different passions. And this is important for us because two years flies by. Uh, some of you may be taking this program for a longer period of time, but please, please take advantage of the incredible connections you make within our community. We do want to see you thrive outside of the classroom as well. So there are tons of student organizations you can get involved with, cultural communities you can feel a part of. Um, and so we want you to take advantage of those opportunities. Um, one way that you can start connecting with our current students, well, by joining today, you will hear from some of our current students in the systems architecting and engineering program, as well as a recent graduate. Um, but you can also chat with them online. So we have uh, various student ambassadors spanning various graduate programs within Viterbi, including your program. Um, and you can chat with them directly and hear a little bit more about what their experience was like and any questions you may have about being a graduate student at USC. Um, so you can see a snapshot of what that looks like here, as well as the links to chat with either our Dennett Viterbi or on-campus um, master student ambassadors. There are lots of other resources available to you to get more of a sense of what USC will be like. One is taking a virtual tour of our campus. Highly recommend doing that so you can see um, not just what our campus looks like, but specifically our engineering buildings and research centers. You can also check out all of the student organizations that our graduate students can join, um, as well as safety and wellness resources. If you happen to be an international student, we also have an office 
dedicated to servicing you and supporting your time at USC in terms of programming, but also knowledge and, and information to ensure that you are um, adhering to visa rules. So just know that we have tons of um, resources and staff and support ready to, to support your success at USC. Um, just a couple housekeeping things. Uh, we have some deadlines coming up. If you are an on-campus student, May 1 is the last day to submit your statement of intent and commitment deposit. So if you are ready to accept your admission offer, please do so as soon as possible, um, but May 1st is the final date. If you are an online student, Dennett Viterbi student, you are encouraged to submit the statement of intent as early as possible. We've also listed here um, the Dennett Viterbi new student orientation, which will take place on July 21st. So mark your calendars. The sooner you submit the statement of intent, the sooner you have access to even more resources, such as information about orientation, as well as our mentorship program, where you can be paired with a current graduate student in Viterbi, who can kind of help you navigate life um, at USC, whether it's registering for courses or getting in touch with faculty and so much more. Um, departments will continue to have academic webinars. We'll get, you'll get to interact with your advisors more in depth. Um, you'll get to create your den at Viterbi profile and also secure housing options if you will be living in LA close to campus. Here's our contact information if you'd like to reach out, um, both if you're an on-campus student or Dedeva Turby student, here's our contact info as well as our social media to stay connected with us. Um, I do want to just mention we have Aaron Tanaka, who is um, services and supports the Dedeva Turby students here with us today. And if you have any questions specific to that, feel free to enter into the chat or the Q&A. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Madney, who is the Executive Director of the Systems Architecting and Engineering Program. You can see all of his incredible accolades here. Um, I don't even know where to begin, but I want you to take a moment to really soak it in. <laughs> he is a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Um, and as I mentioned, he is the director of this program and can help give you all the information you might need to know um, about this field um, and what's to come in your studies. So please go ahead, Dr. Mani, take it away. Thank you, Jessica. Welcome everyone. Welcome to the SAE program. I'll take you on a short journey um, that'll take you through the, the key highlights of this program. And uh, you're free to ask questions at the end of uh, this presentation after we have, because we are here, of course, we intend to serve our students in the best way possible. I have a couple of students here already who have gone through the program and you can speak to them directly about their experience of the program and uh, uh, some of the highlights. So uh, with that, let's go on. I'm a university professor. Uh, I'm a university professor, one of uh, three active professors who are given the designation of university professor in the Viterbi School of Engineering. And I'm the holder of the Northrop Grumman Foundation Fredo Green Chair in Engineering. And as Jessica said, I'm the director of the Systems Architecting and Engineering Program and have been that since uh, 2009. Let's go on to the next. So our mission is very, very simple. It's to produce systems engineers with interdisciplinary problem solving skills and technical leadership skills that are needed in 21st century systems engineering workforce. The, the point is, that not only do we want to have your skill set be relevant to the needs of today, but that they continue to be relevant well into the future as tech new technologies emerge, uh, and new regulations come about, new opportunities arise. And so we give you a way of thinking that allows you to continue in a very seamless fashion to the new opportunities that come your way. Let's go on to the next. A few highlights about the program. This is the longest running graduate system engineering program in the United States. Uh, we actually got going in uh, 1989 with uh, Professor Eb Recton, the late Professor Eb Recton, who passed on. Uh, and I took over the program in uh, 2009 and have been running it since. Our focus is on creating the next generation of system thinkers and with specifically with interdisciplinary skills. You can get by with just engineering. We keep talking about T-shaped individuals and pie-shaped individuals. The basic idea is you need to have skills in multiple areas. You don't have to have the same depth, 
But if you know enough about the other areas, then you can bring interdisciplinary problem solving techniques to address the problem. And that's how our courses are laid out so that they're not stovepipes. They really cut across disciplines. We, act, we in this program view systems architecting and engine, system engineering as complementary and synergistic skills. And the reason we say that is because the kind of thinking that is involved is different in system architecting than system engineering. Systems engineering tends to be much more analytic and reductionist approach based. Systems architecting tends to be much more holistic and integrative skills based. So you, you need the combination of both to be a really good system architect and engineer. My experience is both in research and in practice. I was the guidance navigation control uh, person on the space shuttle many, many years ago, and then ran several uh, public and, and private companies before I came to USC. So I have exper experience in the practical side of things as well as the research side of things. We have a wonderful record of placing our graduates in top industries in academia, and you'll hear more about that shortly. We have graduated around 2,500 students over the last 25 years. Uh, I have actually developed something called Tracy, which is the transdisciplinary system engineering education paradigm and teaching approach. And this is rooted in teaching about engineering while being cognizant of other disciplines like psychology and biology and social science and economics and things of that nature. So people can understand how these various disciplines interact with each other. We also leverage techniques from the cinematic and entertainment arts, such as storytelling, which is really a fundamental way in which I like to teach because people will remember stories. They will not remember facts and figures. We have ongoing collaboration with other schools, specifically education, business, school of cinema and medicine. I have actually appointments in the school of medicine and school of education as well. We have multi-university and multidisciplinary collaboration with uh, faculty and students from other institutions in the United States so that you get a chance to see and cross fertilize our work with them. And we have until recently a very vibrant industry advisory board made up of industry uh, practitioners and uh, leaders. So how is this program different from other programs in the country? So I'll tell it to you in the, in the following way. Uh, our program is multidisciplinary and it covers three main aspects. Systems engineering, systems architecting, and systems thinking. Now, systems engineering, as I noted, is analytic problem solving. And that's true of almost all engineering courses that you take. Systems architecting is synthetic, meaning integrative problem solving. It requires lateral thinking and associative thinking. So you actually develop your skill in reasoning through analogy and examples and things of that nature. And then finally, systems thinking that says that you need to look at the problem as a whole and not in terms of its parts. And this kind of skill is really key to how you formulate problems. You see, most courses, you will learn how to solve problem. But very few courses talk about how do you frame or formulate problems that need to be solved and how do you do it the right way? So that's what we try to teach in, in our courses. The students will learn to see the big picture. And what I mean by that is they will look at the a problem that is confronted in terms of both program and system scope, not in terms of individual subsystems. They'll learn to formulate the right problem. And what that really translates into is resisting oversimplification to fit a technique that you already know. And that's a lazy way out. You end up solving the wrong problem. So we help you formulate the right problem. As important, we help you formulate the problem right, meaning using the right set of methods and skills in combination that help you address that problem. And the methods you will learn, many of them are rooted in what's called model-based system engineering or model-based methods. And they help you address things like design, verification, validation, test and evaluation. I already mentioned to you about the Tracy educational paradigm, which helps you become interdisciplinary and tech have acquired technical leadership skills. And then the final key discriminator is the, we have continuous course improvement because we continue to leverage the findings from our research that we conduct in our distributed autonomy and intelligence systems laboratory. And this research is sponsored by National Science Foundation, the Department of Defense System Engineering Research Center, General Motors, Boeing, et cetera. Let's go on to the next. 
a little bit about our faculty and uh, the instructors. There are three full-time faculty, starting with me, uh, Dr. Barok Hoshnevis, who's also a member of the National Academy of Engineering, who teaches courses in creativity and innovation and product development, and Dr. Ed Maybe, who teaches courses in sustainability. We have seven, uh, oh, I think we have probably more, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, we have eight adjunct faculty and part-time lecturers. And these are top scientists and engineers from the aerospace industry and government organizations. We have Dr. Ellen Pawlikowski, a four-star, retired four-star Air Force General who co-teaches the course in systems architecting with me. And the way that works is I present the theory and the methodologies and stuff. And then she actually gives real world case studies where those methods have been used. So you get to see theory being reduced to practice. And that's a very, very strong uh, you know, contribution of our program. But we don't just keep spouting theories. We actually have people understand real world case studies and examples. So they understand how it was applied. We have uh, Dr. Michael Stevers from the Jet Propulsion Lab who teaches many of our courses. Dr. Mark McKelvin from the Aerospace Corporation who teaches the model-based system engineering course. Dr. Jairus Hine from Jet Propulsion Lab recently retired who teaches the economics of system engineering. Dr. Fan Fan who graduated from USC, my former student. Dr. George Friedman's former student who teaches the advanced course in uh, systems engineering. Dr. Robert Minichelli from the Aerospace Corporation who uh, teaches uh, fundamentals of system engineering and occasionally substitutes for me. Mr. Ken Curitan, who's been teaching here for a very long time, he retired from Boeing and has a 20 year history of teaching in our program. And Dr. Julie Albright, who teaches uh, uh, the sustainability course with uh, Dr. Ed Maybe. This is our staff. And what makes this program unique is not just our technical content, but our team. This is the team. Without the team, a program is nothing more than bits and pieces. But this is the team that pulls everything together. To the left on the top is Del Poisson, who's our SAE business manager. Below her is Linda Lee, who's the budget specialist who helps with our research proposals and things of that in terms of costing them and getting those things on time in the proper format to the various customers. To the top right, you see Luis Sabalos, who will be speaking later today. He's the student services director. He works very closely with me. He's the first person that you go to if you have questions about the program, your, your program plan, your roadmap. If you have questions about taking elective courses and such, this is the person you go to. And then you have Marlon, uh, Marilyn Latt, who is the administrative support for the program. She's like the, the MVP sixth person on the team gets a lot of things done and helps students in a variety of ways. So this is our team and I feel very honored to have them as a part of our uh, you know, overall essay uh, program. I wanna talk a little bit about some of the research areas. Now, many of you probably know these areas or have been working in these areas because quite a few of you are from industry. Uh, but in any case, we are one of the premier organizations in the area of model-based system engineering. In fact, I founded the IEEE System Man and Cybernetics uh, Technical Committee for Model-Based System Engineering. And uh, two of the other members are also teaching in the uh, SAE program. And we have membership from all over the world in this program. The other area that we excel in is called Engineered Resilient Systems. We were the first to get into this place and the most cited papers in this area are written by you know, our authors. The next area is Cyber Physical Human System, which is the 21st century version of human machine system, because now you've got cyber working with the physical, working with the human, and all of them have to work in a very tightly coupled and integrated fashion. And so we have a course in that, uh, a research area in that, and we have a course in that as well. The next thing is the whole area of augmented intelligence, which basically says, rather than use AI to replace humans and automate the task, why not use artificial intelligence to augment the capabilities of humans so that humans can perform beyond their current uh, abilities. So this is a very hot area, something I truly believe in and I have published papers on that. If you Google my name on that term, uh, one of my papers will pop up right away in Google Scholar or uh, in, you know, in Google. The next area, which has great synergy with system engineering, and you must have heard about this, is digital engineering and digital twin technology. Big area. The next area is AI and machine learning for system engineering. And on the flip side, system engineering for AI and machine learning. 
And finally, formal methods in system engineering to make the whole process of system engineering much more rigorous. Our faculty are principal investigator and co-investigators on multiple research projects sponsored by the National Science Foundation, DOD System Engineering Research Center, Acquisition Innovation Research Center, General Motors, and Boeing, both the defense side and the commercial side. Go on to the next. We have a laboratory, as I mentioned, it's the Distributed Autonomy and Intelligence Systems Lab where our PhD students get a chance to flex their creative muscle. And uh, we have this as uh, in our experimental uh, environment, which is in the housed in the USC Research Annex, it's called the RAND building. Mostly PhD students work on research projects in this innovation lab, but we also have some undergrads and some MS students occasionally who are interested in doing research. We have an instrumented test bed for research in autonomous and human machine systems. And the test bed consists of hardware, software connectors, and small scale physical vehicles with embedded onboard sensors to support experimentation. The key point that I wanted to make here is that the research that we do here in this laboratory, the findings from this research inform the material that is taught in our SAE courses. So the courses are never static. Every semester, the courses are updated to reflect the latest findings, not just from our own lab, but from other places as well. This laboratory is directed by me and Professor Dan Irwin, who also happens to be the chair of the astronautical engineering department. So what do students learn in this lab? They learn to model systems, for example, quadcopters, or 116, use 16 Formula One cars, because we use these as our vehicles to try out different uh, algorithms and techniques and uh, machine learning and modeling uh, techniques. Students build and integrate digital twins of physical systems and they integrate these into the simulation environment to be able to test drive them with various conditions. They learn how to collect data from the scenario simulation during execution, and they learn how to experiment with different analysis, optimization, and machine learning algorithms. So these are the capabilities. Um, and the, the Shatad here, who, who is my PhD student, is doing a lot of work in this area, as is Parisa, who I don't think is here today. Um, and we just had a, a student graduate with his PhD just a couple of months ago, who was working extensively in this lab. Professor Irwin is uh, most frequently in that lab because he's an experimentalist and he does a lot of work in that in our laboratory. Let's go on. I talked about the Tracy Education Paradigm. It stands for Transdisciplinary System Engineering Education. And this is in all the major four core courses. We draw on relevant material, not just from engineering, from other related disciplines that have a bearing on engineering. So for example, decision analysis, digital engineering, cognitive psychology, social networks, and entertainment arts are all used to enhance the system engineering and system architects ability to perform the various activities. This educational paradigm is specifically responsive to the needs of the 21st century engineering workforce and their learning proclivities. The way people learn today it's very different than what they did 10 years ago. They need short bursts of information. They need hands-on experimentation and learning. They collaborate a lot on social media and things of that nature. So we take that, all that into account in the way we tailor our courses. Much of the ideas in this education paradigm is based on my book, Transdisciplinary System Engineering, uh, Exploiting Convergence in a Hyperconnected World. This book was published in 2018 by Springer and it's the textbook uh, one of the textbooks for SA 549 and for the other courses as well. The key pillars of the, uh, this educational par paradigm are the following four things. A 21st century mindset, which means a future thinking mindset based on the science of learning principles, which are very simply, it, the courses have to be learner centric. They should build on the prior knowledge of the learner and they should allow the learner to extrapolate what they've learned to new problem situations. Storytelling is an integral part of the way we teach. And then we provide hands-on learning primarily in our labs with digital twin technology. We've implemented these courses, uh, these ideas in our core courses, and they've been well received by students, the instructors who teach and the employers. Go on to the next. What makes this program unique? Unlike reading, students having to read other people's textbooks. In our case, this, the books are written by our instructors. So Ed Recton wrote the book on system architecting, which is still the Bible for architecting. Subsequently, he wrote, the book was written with his student, Mark Mayer, and you can get that book as well, if you like, as a reference. 
Then the next book is written by me, which is Transdisciplinary System Engineering. And then the third book that I wrote with Professor Terry Bale of University of Arizona is called Trade-Off Decisions in Engineering Design. So this is a very, very difficult problem, how to make trade-offs. Simple trade-offs we make every day, but when it gets uh, into uh, engineering and sports and things of that nature, things get very, very tricky. So you know, our faculty members are members of the National Academy of Engineering and fellows in various societies, including AAAS, IEEE and COSI, IISC and AIAA. Our part-time instructors are from the local aerospace industry and they're top-notch adjunct faculty. We have a leadership position in the IEEE SMC Technical Committee on Model-Based System Engineering. We're also the co-founder and organizer of the Conference on System Engineering Research that has been ongoing for the last uh, 25 years almost. I am a member of the National Defense Industrial Association, the Research Council of uh, the Department of Defense System Engineering Research Center, the Research Council of DoD Acquisition Innovation Research Center, and uh, the uh, uh, I'm in the governing body of the Institute of Industrial and System Engineering Body of Knowledge. So we cover the whole waterfront. Let's go on to the next. Here you see the books. So to the left, you see the book that is used in SA 549. It's called System Architecting, written by Recton. And then you have my book in Trade-Off Decision and System Design, and my book on Transdisciplinary System Engineering. And then we have a book with the whole collection of papers on disciplinary convergence in systems engineering research, uh, which is completely based on my book on transdisciplinary system engineering, because that became the theme of this book. And so all the material is written by, primarily by USC professors. We don't have to go uh, look for other books. We have much of that material covered because we have been very proactive in this area. Let's go on to the next. Some little factoids of interest to you. We, until very recently, we have had a very active NCOSI student division at USC, which was supported by the NCOSI Los Angeles uh, chapter. It gave you an opportunity to network with students, industry professionals, and faculty. The reason I say until recently is because many of the students who are in leadership positions as like president, vice president, and stuff, they have graduated. So we will be looking for new students to in the leadership position. And those of you who are here today, if you're interested, please get in touch with me and with Shatad or with Luis, and we will uh, you know, get you properly uh, positioned in this capacity. We have um, events over the year, and that gives you the opportunity to network with other students, industry professionals, and faculty. We are also are very active. We are active in the NCOSI Los Angeles chapter, again, where you get a chance to network with uh, a whole bunch of people, faculty, students from a variety of industries, medical devices, automotive, energy, aerospace, Students get a chance to publish and present papers at NCOSI and AIAA, IEEE, IS, IC conferences. My students are always publishing multiple papers a year. And Shatat can speak to that when you ask him in the panel. We also run the Conference on System Engineering Research that I've been, I've been running it since 2009, actually 2008. Here you have an opportunity to present technical research papers and network with other students from all across the world. You also contribute to the LA mini conference and NCOSI regional conferences. Again, you have a chance to network. So there's a lot of opportunity to network with professional engineers, with student engineers, with faculty and, and such. Let's go on to the next. A lot of potential employers in the area, as you know, we are the hub of aerospace and many other, but here are some examples. So in the aerospace and automotive sector, our students are employed, for example, in aerospace at Boeing, several students, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon Technologies, SpaceX, BAE Systems, Crane Engineering. A recent graduate, Edwin, just started working as a system engineering uh, key guy in Crane Engineering recently. In the automotive world, we are tied into General Motors, Tesla, Toyota, Lyft, Cruise. Also, FFRDCs, federally funded R&D centers and national labs employ our students. And examples of that are the Aerospace Co Corporation, Jet Propulsion Lab, MITRE, and RAND Corporation. Our students also get hired by people in the medical devices, healthcare, and biotechnology industries. And examples of that are Medtronic, Kaiser Permanente, Veterans Administration, and Amgen. Web companies have also hired several of our students, including Google, Amazon, and Facebook. And then, of course, state and city organizations hire system engineers as well. And there, we are, our students have been hired at the Port of Los Angeles, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power and the Metropolitan Water District. Go on to the next. I'm gonna give you a quick overview of the SAE courses. 
So we have SA549, which is system architecting, 541, which is system engineering theory and practice, 542, which is advanced topics in systems engineering, 543, which is case studies, 546, which is engineering resilience systems and system of systems, 547, which is model-based systems architecting and engineering, 548, which is systems and system of system integration and communication, 560, which is the economic consideration of system engineering, 546, which is engineering resilient systems and system of systems. 550 is system architecting in the political process. 515 is sustainable infrastructure systems. And 599, recent course that is foundations for cyber physical human systems. So you can see many of these courses. In fact, I would say 60% of these courses were all created in the last five years or six years because of the changes in the environment and changes in uh, the advances in systems architecting and engineering. What I'm gonna do now is give you a quick overview of each of the course. Go on to the next. So before we go into that, I'd like to share with you how this program is different and why it is suitable for 21st century. We focus on very, very important aspects of the way we think about things. So we think more holistically and not automatically reductionism. We think in terms of self-organizing agents and not some human sitting outside organized, organizing the design of a system or, or a, an organization. We think in terms of agility and resilience and trade-offs and not just optimization, because what is optimal one day may be suboptimal the next. We think about how can we scale up our methods so we can address the problem at real world scale and not dumb down the problem so we can apply a favorite technique. We think in terms of interdisciplinary problem solving skills and not just disciplinary methods. We think about how we can influence the behavior of a system and not try to control it the way you can do with simple systems. We think about how we can introduce incentives and inhibitors to shape the behavior of complex system and not try to work it from a command and control perspective. We think in terms of not just contractual relationships, but making mutual commitments to each other to get the job done. And so with that backdrop and that mindset, I wanna talk about some of the key topics that are very poorly understood, but that we cover very extensively in our courses. How are principles different from heuristics? When do you use which? How is analytic thinking different from integrative thinking? How is a complex system different from complicated system? How is system architecting different from systems engineering? How is resilience different from robustness? And how is integration different from interoperability? What's the difference between optimization and trade-offs? And how, when do you use ontologies and when do you use knowledge graphs? What is the best application for AI versus what's the best application for augmented intelligence? What's the difference between virtual prototype and digital twin? These are terms that you will hear all the time in the system engineering community but we make it very clear. So you have a clear understanding of this terminology and you can actually be very clear when you speak and be precise in the way you describe what you mean. So you'll say what you mean and you'll mean what you say and that this helps you do that. Let's go on to the next. Some key definitions and I'm not gonna go into great depth into them, but one of the things that we define for you right off the bat is what is system architecting? What is system architecture? What is system engineering? And what is transdisciplinary system engineering? In very simple terms, systems architecting is both left brain and right brain. It's both art and science. I define it as an integrative, in, integrative interdisciplinary approach to specifying structure, behavior, interaction, and extension paths of an existing or envisioned system. Its goal is to have a methodology that allows you to reason about the interactions, not just the, the subsystem, but the interactions among the subsystem, which is where the real complexity resides. And the whole idea is, it requires new ways of thinking, such as analogies from other disciplines to make the problem tractable. And that's in my book, I cover that. And then we describe system architecture for you, system engineering for you, and transdisciplinary system engineering, which is to exploit the convergence among different disciplines to solve problems that appear otherwise unsolvable. Go on to the next. Dr. Dr. Mani, just, just a courtesy reminder, we got like about five minutes to cover the courses. Okay, that's fine. So here you have system architecting, the first course, let's go on. In every course, we provide you with a learning objective, the expected outcome, and the course particulars. So right away, when you are making a selection, you are making a selection based on these three factors. Go on to the next. 
Next. Yeah. When you talk about the fundamentals of systems engineering, we, this is the course that you take. Once again, every course has a learning objective, expected outcome and course particulars. Go on to the next. This is the advanced course. Once again, you know what you're gonna get out of the course. Learning objectives are given. What is the expected outcome? What would you be able to do? And what are the course particulars? So every time you know what's going on. This is the course in model-based systems, architecting and engineering. You know what are the core concepts, what you will be able to do when, you're, when it's done and what the course covers. So once again, when you're making your selection, you have that information. Then you have SA 548, which is systems and system and system integration. Once again, you learn what the objectives are, what is the outcome, what are the course particulars? When you go through that specifics, you know what choices you can make because you have the particulars about the course in significant detail. The same thing with SA 546, which is engineered resilient system and system of system. The same thing with the system architecting and the political process because no architecting can be done without taking politics into account. And this course covers that. Go on to the next. The same thing with economic consideration. You cannot build a great, wonderful design and be oblivious of cost. The cost has always to be taken into account and this course covers that. And once again, what it covers is shown there. Then you have sustainability, infrastructure system. And it basically talks about how you build sustainable system. And then the final course is foundations of cyber physical human systems, which is brand new course that will be taught for the first time, hopefully in the fall. Again, you have the learning objectives, what is the expected outcomes and what are the course particulars, what you're gonna get from it. Go on to the next. Now, what I'm gonna do is stop for a few minutes and ask you if you have any questions. If not, I'm gonna turn this over to Luis who will walk you through what it takes to be able to get into the program. What are the choices that you have? Uh, what are the MS program requirements? What are the certificate requirements? And uh, um, who are the points of contact that you contact if you run into any kind of difficulty? Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about Luis. Luis is the director of the uh, student services. And in that capacity, he's the first line of defense uh, that we have in the sense of answering questions of students uh, when they uh, have any questions about coursework, course plan, uh, making a substitution, getting a waiver, all those things you can work it through Luis. Most of the time he'll be able to answer the question. If not, he will escalate it to me and I'll, I'll make a decision and give him an answer that he'll provide to you. So with that, Luis, please take over and uh, go forward. Thank you, Dr. Matney. Appreciate the nice introduction. Um, welcome everyone for your admissions here in our SAE master's program or graduate certificate programs. Um, so just to start off, these are the programs that are offered within the systems architect and engineering area. We have one master's program. Um, as you see there, it is available online for DEN students and is also on campus. Um, the next option being the second popular being the grad certificate SAE program, which is also great. I can provide some details into how you transition from the grad certificate. Are a little unique, but for those interested, we do have a certificate in software architecture and then a certificate in network centric systems. Um, so for the most part, anyone is available to, you know, join the grad certificate and obviously pursue the master's. If you're going straight into the master's or if you're starting with the grad certificate, you can pretty much account the grad certificate being like 50% of the master's and then you just complete it once you have that going. Um, but if we go to the next slide. So starting off with the main program, our master's of science in systems architecture and engineering um, requirements for graduation is a total of 27 units, nine courses, and then you need a minimum of a 3.0 GPA. Um, so this is a new change we made to this program. Previously was 30 units. So we've now made it um, 27 units. We made a discount on the tech specialization area. Um, and then you can see there the requirements for the courses as you'll see on the next slide, the official classes. Um, we have five courses for the masters in the required section, which is SAE 549. That's the flagship course for the program. And every single SAE student should begin with that course, um, just so you could get the foundational approach with systems architecting and engineering. And then afterwards, you can pick in any order if you like SAE 541, for example, or you can pick from SAE 547 or SAE 548. And then the last sequence as available, SAE 560 or ISE 460. We recommend for you to take our course, SAE 560, 
and as I mentioned right there is preferred. And the other detail to mention here, SAE 541 is the prereq for SAE 542. So that's the only one prereq that you pretty much have to go through first and then obviously go to the second part. And then we go to the electives. We have SAE elective, which that can be any SAE course that it's outside of those five requirements. So for example, some students might take SAE 547 as a required course, and then you can also take SAE 548 as the SAE elective. Then we have a technical management area is really popular for this program. And you can pick from any of those courses there listed. Um, popular choice, always SAE 550. The political process class is a great class and you know definitely recommend taking that. The last piece, which is really important, the technical specialization area, you only pick two courses um, but they need to be from the same engineering area. So that's where you all can branch out and make your own concentration. If you have an interest in artificial intelligence, maybe you'll pursue those computer science courses that are listed as such. Or if you have a mechanical aerospace background that you can go through towards the AME courses. Or we have another um, program that I also oversee, the astronautical engineering program. A lot of our SAE students might have interest in that concentration. So they would pick their two courses from any of those engineering area. So the main thing to focus on is to make sure the two courses are from the same abbreviated engineering area. Um, as always mentioned, please, please feel free to reach out to me if you need counseling or any sort of advice on what courses to, to select. And you know we can always just discuss your course plan and anything that you might wanna discuss about you know, throughout your time here at USC. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, if for those of you that are starting with the grad certificate, the approach is still the same, right? You start the grad certificate and then eventually you go on to the master's. But for those of you that are just doing strictly the grad certificate is only five classes and you just get to pick from those courses listed below. Most of those are the five required for the master's. So that's why we say you're pretty much completing 50% of the program through the grad certificate. And then you just reapply and do the master's for those of you that are doing the grad certificate. Um, if we go to the next one. This one is a little bit more unique, but same thing, five courses. You pick from the from the elective one, and then you have those four required courses. And as always, you want to start off with SE 549, our flagship course. And then our last um, certificate program. This one I haven't had a student yet to pursue, but it seems really interesting for those of you that have the computer science background or electrical engineering background. And then this is like the requirements for this program. Um, as I mentioned, I will oversee all of these programs. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, in our next slides, I'll provide my details of, of my advising, how to get a hold of me. But the course delivery method, obviously, if you're on campus, usually you're full time, takes about three classes per semester. Master students to be full time, you need eight units or more. Since our courses are three units, then that looks about that looks like um, three courses per semester. Takes about one and a half to two years to complete. And for those of you that will be online, you have obviously more time. So you might take about two and a half to three years, one or two classes per semester. For those of you that are working in the industry and just starting in the program and probably haven't gone to school in a few years, we recommend taking one class. For those that are recent grads and are working and want to just get to the program, then you can do two courses. But we always recommend use the first three weeks of classes, which is the add and drop trial area. And if you've decided that maybe two courses might be a little bit too much, then go ahead and drop. That way you can you're, you can receive your refund and still kind of continue on with the program. All students have five years to complete this program. So just so you have an idea of, you know, you, you got extra years so you can make it work for yourself. This is my student or my, my contact information for all the students to reach out to me. Email is usually the easiest way to get a hold of me, but I am in my office on Tuesdays. And you can reach me via phone, which is connected through my Zoom. So don't feel that you can only contact me on Tuesday. I'm available Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. till 5 p.m. So if you ever want to stop by and say hello, this is my office, Olin Hall building. You'll see it here by the Viterbi quad, the Viterbi buildings, if you're ever on campus. Um, I do make appointments for, for, for meetings with me, and I can provide that detail later on. Um, a lot of this information for the requirements and course stuff and procedural stuff will be covered in the orientation. For those of you that will be part of the DEN orientation, I'll obviously see you again and we'll go more in depth with the class selection and all the logistics of being a USC student. Um, so that would pretty much cover a lot of the content for the SAE program. 
I know we have some student panelists here that, you know, were nice enough to join us on their time and, you know, they will provide some answers to the questions that some of you sent in previously or some of the questions we have listed for them. That way it can provide some good insight into their experience and hopefully that can help you all, you know, just get the whole USC environment down and maybe you can make your decision to join us here in the fall. Um, but besides that, we'll go ahead and get started with that. We have um, Tim Lott, who is one of our SAE alumni. He was part of the DEN program. We also have Shatad Priyawit, who is our SAE PhD student. He completed the SAE master's as well, so he has great experience. And our current in-campus student, Walid Al-Haiza. Um, he just started our program last semester in the fall. He's pretty much halfway through at this point in the spring, and he also has great experience for those of you that will be in person. Um, so if you all want to just share a little bit about yourself and your current situation or where you currently work and so on and so on, we'll, we'll get it. We could go ahead and get started. Hey, Louis, how's it going? This is Tim. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, um, yeah, so I started in 2017, I believe, taking a, a master's in SAE. Um, just a little bit about myself. I'm a, I was just at the time working as a full-time Boeing employee in electrical wire installation. My current role, I'm a, I'm a manager over there, um, and I graduated in about two years from the program, so 2019. So, yeah, I mean, thanks to everybody who who gave a pitch today. Lewis, you were right on point as far as the flexibility um, as when you want to take the classes, you can finish in a year and a half or five years. I know people who've done the full five years. And to me, that sounds like a complete nightmare. I mean, I did not want to stay here taking one class every semester. You know, I kind of wanted to get in and get out. Um, I see Professor Curitan's in here right now. And he gave a good story in one of my classes. It was the political process class. I highly recommend it if you guys are on um, taking that class. But he had a student in there who he didn't want. He didn't want A's. He didn't want C's. All he wanted to do was B's. No more. Not a B plus. Just a B. He wanted to do that throughout his entire semester. And I kind of took that and ran with it. You know, I wanted to get in, get out, just do the get in, get the information that I needed and then get out the door. Um, I think Aaron invites me to these uh, webinars because I had, when I joined, I was working full time. I ended up taking one class my first semester because I didn't, you know, I didn't really feel comfortable with my calculus or anything like that. Um, so I wanted to see if I could even do it. And then after that, it was just full time, three classes a semester and, and let me get out of here. But on top of that, I had the two kids working full time and I was still able to make it happen. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, utilize all the resources, definitely. I don't know if Patty Reinhardt's still here, but talk to her, talk to all the advisors. Um, they're really flexible. Lewis was showing the, uh, the types of classes, three courses from here, three courses from there. They're extremely, f uh, flexible and friendly, and they will work with you along the way to help you, um, get all of your career aspirations going. So. Yeah, I'll pass it on to the next person. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Tim. Thank you. Uh, hi, this is uh, this is Walid. Uh, yeah, I joined the USC and uh, system, Master of Systems Architecting Engineering uh, last fall, and f f uh, as a f I took the full time as a, a system architect in the spring. Uh, most of the classes, so you look into systems from different points of uh, views, uh, either from economic point of view in SAE 560 or to understand systems and how to architect them as well as how to engineer them. So in this program, before that, I, I worked at, as a research specialist at the Center for Complex Engineering Systems at MIT and CACS, and, uh, but this program helped me to how to look into the whole system from the beginning instead of facing troubles half the way through and then to spend the rest of the time on the project just to fix the issues that we had. Uh, so I guess uh, and half the way through the program, I learned a lot and I'm interested uh, to, I'm looking forward to the classes that I'll be taking in the next uh, year. And uh, yes, please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Walid. Appreciate it. Thank you.
Yes, so my name is Shadad Purohit. Uh, I joined USC for Master of Science in Systems Architecting and Engineering in fall of 2018. And I did for two years masters i completed all the sa courses and after completing masters i joined phd in the same domain uh, i'm from india and the reason i selected usc and the, this specific major is because of the architecting focus on uh, in, in the in, in the program there are many systems engineering courses all across the world and i feel that this is the only one with this explicit focus on systems architecting, which is, which I felt like which is need need of the hour, and the kind of courses which were which are there, uh, for example, model based systems in systems architecting and engineering, systems integration, system of systems engineering. These are very specific courses you will only find at USC. It is very rare to find these kind of courses with the kind of specialization, and uh, and one of the other reason I chose. Uh, USC was because of the professors here, Dr. Madni, who is like right at the top in systems engineering faculty all across the world, uh, prof and many other professors from industry, like Professor Kirtan from Boeing, Professor Mike Sievers from JPL, and many other people uh, who bring in the real world experience uh, while teaching. So these are the main reasons. I selected USC well, when, when I came here. Thank you, Sutar. Thank you all for sharing about your experience and a little bit about yourselves. So now kind of going a little bit deeper with the academic side, what would you say is your favorite course? This would be like a three-part question. And was it difficult to manage through these courses? And were they a project-based or a theoretical course? Yeah, I'll go first. Uh, this is Tim again. I would say uh, another shout out to uh, Professor Curitan. Go to skit.com, S-K-I-T.com. Look over, the, he has so much stuff on there with all the syllabus um, or syllabi, I should say. And, you know, you can really get a feel for what each class has by going in and looking at past papers um, that other students had wrote. Uh, but I would say for me, the one that has stuck with me for, you know, since I graduated would probably be SAE 550 systems architecting in the political process. There's just so much, you know, Modney was talking about it, that lateral thinking. Um, and I, I mean, I'm telling you, really, you do come that pie shaped engineer or that pie shaped person from that T shaped engineer. You start thinking about things that you didn't necessarily think about in the past. One of those things being is just jobs, jobs, jobs. And that's what this you know, country is based on is keeping people at work and how important that is to the political process and engineering as a whole, because engineering is just such a, things have just gotten so expensive, you, it's hard to do it in the private sector. So that's, that's me. Awesome, that's great. Walid? Uh, for me, uh, personally, when I look at it, I look at it uh, into the collection of the classes that I'm taking. So as I explained, when I say the SAE 560, which is the uh, looking systems uh, uh, from an economic, uh, economic point of view, uh, this class helped me uh, look into systems. Uh, so after learning the, through the, the material, using uh, looking into a system that I'm interested in, and to use the materials that I learned to assist it economically. So this way I learned the economics within systems architecting and engineering. Then in another class, I learned about how to actually formulate the system from looking to the client needs and stakeholders to until the last step of testing and verification. So uh, I, I, what I appreciate about uh, the master's program is how it helped me uh, learn about all of those different areas within different courses. So it's more about the collection than just single courses. To bring, to bring out. Thank you. Awesome. That's great. Shutar. Uh, my favorite subject is SAE 549, taught uh, by Dr. Madni and Professor Ellen. Uh, one of the reasons I like that uh, sub subject is the kind of things you learn from the professors there. 
for example like dr madni professor madni brings him his 40 or 50 years of experience in the domain where he led various organization in aerospace and defense industry he was ceo and cto of these organizations and took very critical early stage decisions these are called as like systems architecting decisions the same with professor ellen uh, she worked in uh, air force and was part of many programs what happens is like many other courses if you go in like computer science or electrical engineering you learn what is there in the book but in this in this course you learn what are the different experiences these professors had how them how they made decisions while going across uh, the life cycle of whatever they they were working on uh, the products and how they took those decisions so that's the very critical uh, skills right now we need uh, systems architecting skills and it is very rare to get these kind of skills on internet or anywhere else like if you want to learn computer science you go to edx course here and lot of other online platforms but the kind of skills you learn uh, problem solving skills decision making skills systems architecting skills modeling skills uh, and many other domains like you you get uh, in sa 549 you get introduced to digital twins uh, and how, what are the mathematical back backgrounds of digital twins you get to know what are the inter level and intra level dependency structure matrices how do you do pattern analysis or like you data analytics in integrate that with systems architecting so these are the means there are like aspects of machine learning and ai as well uh, in in decision making that you get introduced to in that such courses so i highly recommend everyone to start with that course thank you shwetar well that's great to hear that everyone had a little bit of a different interest with obviously tim sae 550 walid sae 560 and a little bit of everything and then shwetar with the flagship course kind of changing gears now we have a few minutes before we end uh but just to kind of keep going with the student aspect side how how have you all gotten involved obviously everyone has a different dynamic and circumstance um you can all speak to your own specific circumstance how did you get involved if is since you're a professional like your case tim how were you involved with the school and how did you use it for your professional aspiration or same with you walid how have you gotten involved in your first year here at USC and then obviously shatad you're a little bit more experienced what have been the resources or opportunities that you see available for on campus students in SAE um so starting with you tim what what do you have to say yeah so i'm a USC ambassador um so i you know i'll i'll help in that manner um and that one other thing i'll just say is like everything you're going to learn in SAE at least for me i was able to apply immediately to my job like the next day everything everything from every class i was able to just relate over to industry and it, it was really it was really kind of impressive because i didn't know that much about sae but i'll tell you one thing and, and you guys touched on it a little bit is about your professors and how wide range they are from jpl to old, to uh, retired boeing folks to doctors right and so I think one of the biggest impacts I've had is with my community. Um I live in Long Beach and there's which is kind of around the area of USC if you're not familiar with the area but um I did I did uh tours with one of my professors um with Dr. Sievers like you said he works at JPL um and after that I was able to to coordinate some of our uh I'll say quote unquote troubled youth so these are kids from high school that got kicked out of high school and they're going to like a secondary high school and then they started um doing tours with Dr. Seaver at JPL which kind of gets kind of relates back to the community and gets everybody involved and these are um you know these are the people who need it the most and they're also future leaders for um for not only engineering but from our community as a whole so that was a very special like close to my heart type story that um how i kind of have been involved even after the fact so yeah thanks for allowing me to share thank you so much sim that's great i actually live nearby long beach so I, that's awesome to hear that's that's great What yeah so it's long beach it, it's a it's reed high school long beach reed over here oh okay Sounds the second it's a secondary high school yeah nice that's great what about you walid how has your first year been so far here at usc sorry that was me uh well uh, this the past year has been exciting especially that 
it keeps getting better, especially after the COVID uh, situation has uh, relieved and uh, the full activity is back also on campus. So this has helped me uh, to either uh, SAE classes and the, through the electives that uh, SAE program pr provides uh, to meet multiple uh, students from different backgrounds to, to listen about uh, startups that started here in uh, USC and uh, came up to it. So this was uh, the most exciting part. And I'm actually more excited about even the next year because uh, things uh, like the COVID situation is much better now. And, uh, so that's why it's things are so look super exciting, especially for uh, the next year. That's awesome. That's awesome. And what about you, Shatal, lastly? Yes. So I'm here for like around three and a half years now. So uh, uh, the thing is that I feel the SAE group is very close group compared to other departments. You have like access to all the professors and students and research faculty very uh, handy. So that's a very good thing to have for all the SAE students. I think they need to get involved more. They need to interact. They can interact very quickly. Uh, there are a number of uh, activities going on on camp uh, in the SAE. For example, we are running an SAE digital twin uh, research group. And plus there is a DIAS research lab run by Dr. Madni, a distributed autonomy and intelligence systems laboratory. So if you want, if you want to get involved, there are possibilities of, the, of, of that sort. And one, one thing I learned is uh, I was... Uh, in industry for four years before joining SAE and whatever I learned in those four years, I think I learned equivalent in like four or one, four months while after joining here because it, because of the vibrant research group, which you get around you. So uh, there are a number of possibilities. I uh, wish everyone all the best. Arto. Thank you so much, Shatar. So that will conclude the student panel. I know we have Professor Curriton. He hasn't had a chance to speak. I don't know if you would like to share a few words before we close out with Dr. Matney and myself. Um, Actually, in the interest of time, I'll go ahead and let Dr. Matney speak. He has many words of wisdom that I believe he needs to share with everyone. I look forward to supporting the student community and working with everyone. Dr. Matney, over to you. Thank you so much, Professor Curriton. You have to unmute Dr. Martin. I think you're muted. You're okay. There you go. Yeah, I want to say first of all, I want to again welcome every one of the incoming students. I think you are in for a, an exciting journey. I think you're going to learn a lot. I think you'll get to know uh, lots of other people. I think it'll change the way you think about problems. I think you will think about the importance of uh, other disciplines to engineering and how they can help in uh, contributing. I think people that come out of this program are going to be very well-rounded. They're not going to be stovepiped in one particular discipline. We have a wonderful team in the SA program, Luis being one of the key people in there and the rest of the people that you saw in the presentation. They're all accessible. We are very student-centric. We try to do the best for our students and try to get the students uh, the best advice that we can. The instructors are you know, really uh, quite, uh, uh, knowledgeable in, in the field, in the sense of practice. You know, there's the old adage that says, in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. And what we are able to do with our instructors is actually bridge theory and practice. So you can see what the latest developments in the field are and how they get applied to uh, real world problems. And I think that uh, the PhD students that we have here are also very friendly. Uh, you can uh, contact them and they will give you the right advice because obviously they've been successful. They're moving on towards their doctorate. And uh, uh, we've got, uh, you know, uh, three PhD students, uh, uh, you know, who are full-time students, uh, one of them who is off-campus student, and they're all doing well. They're making excellent progress. One of them just graduated and got a job with Crane Engineering. The other two are PhD candidates and one more is about to become a PhD candidate. So I think they're, everybody's making excellent progress. And I invite you to come and see us in person if you want to. Uh, we're here and you know, be happy to talk to you in person and see uh, how we can be of help to you. So with that, I wish you nothing but uh, success in your uh, journey at, you know, within USC. And remember that it's not just about the learning in the classroom, it's the entire experience of this campus and the people. So go for the entire experience. Don't just rely on the textbooks in the classroom.
that's what I would say. Good luck and, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Mani. I appreciate the kind words. Everyone, we will disseminate this recording to you all via email, and we will also add a PDF version of the presentation so you can access the details of the presentation and kind of just review on your own. I wanted to say thank you to our VASE team, Ms. Jessica Stern and Ms. Erica Tanaka, and then Dr. Matney, Professor Curriton, our student panelists. Thank you all for joining us. For those of you that are getting the recording, please feel free to reach out to me and I can always follow up with any questions that you may have. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you, Luis. All right. Thank you, Luis. All right.